cannot argue or quarrel with anything that Cuba has done in the interest of Africa. I mean, the, the reason why Angola, uh, the reason why South Africa, uh, uh, to a great extent, that apartheid was... Uh, uh, Bissau and the rest of them... Uh, right after Lumumba was assassinated, it was the Congolese who weren't ready to fight at that time. But see, the thing about it is, that's the, that's the military aspect of things. So that's synonymous with uh, what the tradition of revolution. But nobody ever thought that through the field of medicine, they'd be making the breakthroughs that they make. And the other thing that they've demonstrated, Brother Robert, is they have gone to countries that are not ideologically compatible with them. People in Italy waving the Italian flag and Cuban flag together, oh my goodness. And wait till the time comes when the Democrats and Republicans have to let them through this country. This will be the most significant breakthrough since we smashed the draft during the Vietnam War, when we were 33% of the military, even though we were 18% of the population. Victory is coming. To get them into the United States, wouldn't that, uh, you know, wouldn't that be, um wouldn't you encounter the, the opposition of uh, the white uh, uh, Florida Cubans uh, who do not want anything to that, do that with comes, the... that comes That comes with the territory. We encounter them every day. Don't forget where I live. You said it. I live in Washington, D.C. The Pentagon watch me every day. The CIA watch me every day. The FBI watch me every day. The ATF watch me every day. The DT DEA watch me every day. We even have library police now. So part of this process is we're not just fighting to stop the police from policing us in Minnesota, policing us in Atlanta, policing us in DC, policing us in New York, policing us in Baltimore. We want them to stop policing us in Cuba, policing us in Venezuela, policing us in Zimbabwe policing us in Colombia, policing us in Jamaica. We want you, the United States and European Union's uh, military outlets, be it in the form of diplomacy, be it in the form of military, be it in the form of intelligence to stop policing the world. Now, uh, I, well, I, and that is a very commendable goal. Uh, well, we definitely, the fight is ongoing. It's not going to stop. <clears throat> but the fight also requires pragmatism, as uh, some will say. Now, uh, so uh, I, got, I came across this quote from you uh, that I want to bring to um, what we're discussing. You say, Pan-Africanism is not an ideology, it's an objective. Now, uh, in order to achieve that objective, okay, uh, we have to, uh, the fight has to be on all fronts, okay? Um, there has to be people playing different roles. It has to be a division of labor, so to speak. Are you ignoring the resources within uh, where you are, the United States, where you can tap into the 42 million black people that we have on there that can come to Africa? We have, we have an appeal right now that, of people who support this effort. Um, the National Council of Churches, which is the most powerful religious body in this country, supports what we're doing. Um, the Mumia Abu Jamal, who is fighting for his life right now, supports what we're doing. The daughter of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, of course, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was the first leader to recognize the triumph of this um, Cuban revolution, support what we're doing. We have we um, the National Medical Association. I, we just had a meeting the other day with the um, one of the founding members of the World Conference of Mayors, um, out of Tuskegee, Johnny Ford. He's going to be involved in this effort. We're working with the National Conference of Black State Legislators on this. We, in the 23rd district of Alabama, one of the poorest parts of the United States, we just facilitated a meeting between the mayor of Newark, the Honorable Raz Baraka, and the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations, um, His Excellency um, Pedro Cuesta. So we, we're working with elected officials on this. We're working with students on this. Matter of fact, um, the uh, Black Student Union at DeMatha Catholic High School in Hyattsville, Maryland, known for their athletics all over the country, they, they are in support of what we're doing. In terms of the arts, we've had two concerts of cultural and artistic tributes, if you will. We did one in July of 2020, and we just did one at the end of February. In two concerts, my brother, we've had artistic artists participate from 10 African nations, eight Caribbean nations, um, 17 United States cities, six uh, European Union countries. Does that sound like we're diversifying our efforts? So we're, we've got journalists involved that support that are supporting what we're doing. 
We've got students involved. We've got workers involved. We've got women involved. Every sector of society. And because this is a Pan-African initiative, we're focusing on how we're going to do this in the United States. Because remember, this is the 21st anniversary of a pact between the Congressional Black Caucus and the Cuban government that they were willing to offer 500 medical scholarships a year to US born Africans, commonly referred to as African Americans, to go to the Latin American School of Medical Sciences in Havana for a seven year program worth $250,000. And they would come back to the poorest parts of Georgia, the poorest parts of Mississippi, the poorest parts of Alabama, the poorest parts of Virginia, the poorest parts of Maryland, and be active in those countries. And that is a continuation of the work that Booker T. Washington started in 1915 when he established Negro Health Month. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, arguably his biggest opponent, 10 years before that wrote a study called The Physique and Health of the Negro American, saying that we were more vulnerable in the arena of health care in 1905 than we were when our ancestors were restricted to plantation life as um, chattel. So this is a fight that we've been having for a long time. This goes back to when the National Medical Association was established in 1896. And we, and it's just, we have a certain understanding of the issue. We've approached this very strategically. And it's a microcosm of the sentiment of the world. Because if you look at devoted the United Nations every year, over 180 countries are against the blockade on Cuba imposed by the United States after they failed with this, with the Bay of Pigs invasion the year before in 1961. There's no one's going to contest the, 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 the factualness of everything that you just enumerated. But I still come back to pragmatic efforts to include other pan Africanists who might not be as knowledgeable or as passionate about uh, the role of Cuba in, in Africa. In the larger context, we're still going to be very limited because we're looking at a very big problem, right? And Cuba itself has its own issues. Castro was very dedicated to, to, to the cause and all that, but do you, do you assume that that is carry, will carry forward in 2021 with the rest of, of, uh, of the Cuban society, the way it's constituted? There's also discomfort in the Pan-Africanist uh, 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 sector with assuming that there, there's a difference between one white guy and another white guy. I'm just, what I'm, I mean by that is Cuba has, um, there's racism in Cuba, even the way it is right now, uh, even within the power structure in Cuba even under uh, Raul Castro. So mm -hmm. uh, are we to rely on the same intensity that Cuba had in the past that that's going to continue going forward, especially under this new dispensation that, uh, you know, where Cuba is opening up, the influence of uh, uh, Florida, uh, Cubans, and the rest of it? And how do, are you going to be able to bring the rest of the Pan-Africanist community behind you to, uh, to achieve what the goals that we need to achieve? I'm, I'm confident that we're going to be able to do it because the bottom line is that's just a challenge, which you're just what you're describing is a challenge. And one of the most beautiful characteristics of history itself is the challenges that it imposes on you. Um, I, for, we will show footage of the concert to anybody that wants to see it. And when they see these Africans um, doing hip hop, these Africans doing salsa, these Africans doing classical music, these Africans doing jazz, these Africans doing soul music. Obviously, there has to be a revolution that believes in empowering artists to do this. So that's not by coincidence. So I think that when people look at the results, when they go there and they see the Africans that are trained at the Latin American School of Medicine, the Africans that are trained in physics, the Africans that are trained in the sciences, the Africans that are trained in sports, they will see the Africans that are being trained in the diplomatic sector the Africans that are being trained in the military sector. The question is, what steps are they taking to eradicate it? And I challenge anyone to find another country in the Western Hemisphere where our people were displaced, where our people were stolen, that has done more to eradicate racism than Cuba has. So we're not so we're not saying that it does not exist. We're not saying that they represent perfection, but we are very impressed by their solidarity. We believe their goodwill is authentic. We feel that um the uh angle in the narrative that some are using, the objective of it is to divert attention away from the blockade. And when the blockade is lifted, 
Africans who have lived there will be in a better position to benefit from the fruits of the revolution. And they benefited immensely, but when the, but we're talking about the loss of $200 billion, $200 billion towards a free education program, $200 billion towards free health care, $200 billion between uh, the most aggressive effort to eradicate homelessness in the Americas. So we will continue to be the beneficiaries of the revolution when, when more resources are made available. So the number one focus focus is to end the blockade. And most people will say that that is the number one focus. And we'll continue to watch certain things. And we feel that by their interaction with us. The other thing also is we understand that because of the Marxist-Leninist narrative, there's something that we understand. And we saw this through our interaction with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union always found African nationalism disturbing. The Chinese, to a degree, found our nationalism disturbing. But that was just because at that time, when they came, when they were growing, they many people associated nationalism through Mussolini, through Hitler, through Julius Caesar, through colonialists and imperialists, because what they did to stain the world, they did under the guise of nationalism. And the same way that we were able to show people what spiritual representation looks like when you honor a spiritual belief system and what we've done to beautify Christianity, to beautify Islam, to beautify our indigenous spiritual systems. We beautified nationalism for the world. When we said black power, we made it beautiful. When we said black is beautiful, we made it beautiful. When Osajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah said, we're no longer the Gold Coast, we're Ghana, we made it beautiful. When the Rhodesian flag came down and the Zimbabwean flag went up, it was beautiful. When we said we're not Portuguese East Africans, we're Mozambicans, we made it beautiful. When we said this is not Northern Rhodesia, this is Zambia, that was beautiful. So when people through interacting with us see how nationalism can be made beautiful, see how Pan-Africanism can be made beautiful, when you look at the revolutionary examples of it, not the Pan-Africanizing of neo-colonialism, which many people get into, and we'll deal with that before we get out of here today, we, we will make people see through our experience how we have made nationalism beautiful, how we've made Pan-Africanism beautiful, how we made spirituality beautiful, which is part of the decolonization process when you take a revolutionary approach to it strategically and pragmatically. And our relationship with Cuba, they are getting a chance to see that. And they are growing and evolving and we're growing and evolving. But like I said, objective number one when it comes to dealing with Cuba is ending the blockade on Cuba and defending their territorial sovereignty.